Hi, my name is Jin and I'm the founder of Money Geek. And welcome to the first episode of the short course on investments. In this episode, I want to talk about compound returns and risk. So let's start with compound returns. There's really two types of returns when it comes to investments, and those are simple returns and compound returns. And let me explain the difference between those two using an example. So let's say that you lent me $10,000 at 5% per year in simple interest rate. Then what happens is that after year one, I will have owed you $10,500, and in year two, I will have owed you $11,000, and in year three, $11,500, and so forth. So in that sense, I will have owed you just $500 more every single year. Now, compound interest, on the other hand, is different. So let's say that you let me $10,000 at 5% per year compounded. Then what happens is that after year one, I will still have owed you $10,500, but in year two, I will not have owed you $11,000, but rather $11,025. So where did the extra $25 come from? Well, it's like this. It's as if I borrowed $10,000 and after year one, I repaid you, but then I reborrowed the same amount. So I borrowed $10,500 again after year one. So the 5% interest on $10,500 is $525, which is why after year two compounded, I will have owed you $11,025. And this goes on year after year after year, which means that as time goes by, the amount of money involved grows larger and larger, and so the interest payments become larger and larger as well. It's as if you had like a money snowball that gets bigger the bigger it gets. And this compounding can be a very powerful force. Rumor has it that Albert Einstein was once, was once asked what he thought was the most powerful force in the universe. And he replied, compound interest. Now legend has it that the whole island of Manhattan was bought for just five pearls in 1626 from the Indians. So at that time, people figured that five pearls were worth about $1,000 in today's monetary value. And 384 years later, in 2010 when it was assessed, the whole of Manhattan, the land underneath all of Manhattan, was deemed to be worth about $210 billion. Now let me ask you a question. What is the rate of return compounded on someone who bought the whole island of Manhattan for $1,000? Turns out, the answer is just 5.1%. So in other words, if you invested $1,000 and let it compound at 5.1% over 384 years, you would get $210 billion at the end of that 384 years. But you might say, well, that's interesting, but how is that relevant to me? I'm not going to live 384 years. So you're probably right. So let's bring it back down to earth. So let's say that you had $10,000 to invest and you invested it at 6.5% per year for 30 years. Then at the end of those 30 years, you will have received $66,000. But compare this against the scenario where you invest $10,000 at 8.5% per year. So a difference of just 2%. Then at the end of 30 years, you will have received $116,000. So a difference of about $50,000 just because you invested it at 2% per year higher. Now let's take a slightly different example. Let's say you invested the same $10,000, but instead you invested it for 60 years. Now, if you're 30 and you're watching this, you might very well live another 60 years. So this is very relevant to us. So if you invested $10,000, at 6.5% a year for 60 years, then at the end of it, you will have received $430,000. Now, that's not bad, right? But let's compare that against a scenario where you were able to invest at 8.5% per year 
for 60 years. In that scenario, you will have received $1.3 million. That's the difference of almost $900,000. Now, if you keep up with this course, you'll eventually see that 6.5% and 8.5% a year actually mean something. I chose them strategically. But for now, just understand this key point. The key point is that compound returns is a powerful force such that even 2% per year difference can make a huge difference over time. So now that we covered compound returns, let's now talk about risk. And again, I would like to explain this concept using an example. Let's say I proposed you a bet. Let's say that I flip a coin, and if it turns heads, then I pay you $22,000. But if it flips uh, tails, then you pay me $20,000. Now, would you take this bet? Now, unless you're very rich, you probably wouldn't, and neither would most other people. But why not? On average, you would stand to make money by taking this bet. But most people instinctively know that the potential gains is just not worth the risk. So here's the thing about investments. Every investment opportunity comes with some degree of risk. So when you're evaluating an investment opportunity, you have to analyze both potential returns and risk. You can't just uh, analyze potential returns and invest on that basis. You have to understand how risky it is. Now, there are ways of measuring risk using numbers, and the most common measure of risk is called standard deviation. Now, I won't go into details about the mathematics of standard deviation, but let me just give you an example. So if you have an investment opportunity where you have 50% chance of the opportunity doubling in value or halving in value, then that opportunity has a higher standard deviation than another opportunity where 50% of the time it might go up 10% and the other time it will go down by 7%. So the more varied the future could be, the, more, the higher the standard deviation. So that's what I had to say about risk. So what have we learned today? We learned that compound returns makes money into a snowball, which allows it to grow faster, the bigger it gets. And we also learned that we should always be mindful of risk when it comes to analyzing investments, and that this, there's one really common way of measuring risk, and that's called standard deviation, where the higher the standard deviation, the higher the risk. And that concludes the first episode of the short course on investments. In the next episode, I'll cover diversification and liquidity. So thank you very much for watching and I'll hopefully see you the next time.